What is going on everybody and welcome to part 31 of our machine learning tutorial series. In the previous few videos and really the previous mini series we've been talking about the support vector machine specifically. The last few videos we've been talking about kernels and really we've been talking about kernels in respect to non-linearly separable feature sets and we're explaining how you can use a kernel to translate your data into a higher dimension, do a dot product and get the scalar value or do an inner product more specifically actually, do the inner product, get that scalar value, have it come back to you and actually having had to never visit that whatever that Z space happened to be. You don't actually have to go to all those dimensions and we at least exemplified this with the polynomial kernel where first we calculated it by hand to the second order polynomial and just pulling it out into the Z space took a lot of time and then doing the dot product also took a lot of time in the Z space. Whereas when we actually did the second order, well, when we did the polynomial kernel and kind of mimicked that second order polynomial, we saw that it was actually much quicker, much fewer variables and doing the dot product was just easier by hand and it's also quite a bit easier by processor. And that was only second order, order, right? So in that case, we had n equals two for the number of dimensions and then p was also equal to two. But imagine it had we make, made p 100 and n 1000, right? Would that have made our polynomial kernel take much more processing, like exponentially more processing? No. Would it have uh, caused an exponential increase in uh, just actually, you know, translating to the Z space and running that dot product. Yes, that would have been crazy. So that's one thing we we kind of ended on the radial basis function kernel and explained how that can translate into seemingly infinite dimensions. And now what we're going to be talking about is where that can, you know, problems that can come up when you might do something like that. And one, how to know maybe is your data actually just never going to be linearly separable or should you maybe try another kernel maybe or something along those lines. So that's what kind of what we're going to be talking about here. And specifically, we're going to introduce the soft margin support vector machine. So imagine you've got this data set I've drawn up here. And looking at it, you know, is this linearly separable? Uh, not, no, <laughs> right? There is no straight line that we can draw that will do this. But imagine that we run the RBF and we come up with a decision boundary that probably looks, you know, something like, I don't know, something, something like that, right? And in this case, we're going to have our, I'll do in a, in a lighter green, the, the actual support vector hyperplane. So, you know, coming through here probably comes down here, comes up here, goes out here. And then here you come down here, maybe cross into that one, this one, that one. Okay, and you go out. Okay, so, so that would be in theory via the radial basis function. And now let's go ahead and just circle all of our support vectors here. Bam, 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 bam. Bam, bam, this one, this one, and this one. And out of this entire data set, only two feature sets are actually not support vectors. <laughs> okay, that is a major red flag. Why is that a red flag? Well, it kind of signals that we probably have some overfitment going on here. Okay, so if we can find a function that like, you know, fits all of this data, we're probably in, in, in some trouble here. So, uh, so, so instead of maybe doing what we've just done, I will put us back to just have that, that single decision boundary. Uh, what if we drew another one that, right? A, a almost, you know, basically a straight line that separates the data. And if we we're to look at this, we can see, okay, we've got uh, a few violations, right? You've got maybe this violation here. Uh, this is a violation. And basically, yeah, those just those, sorry, punch my microphone, punch you guys. So, so you've got these two violations here. Otherwise, everything else fits this line. And again, what if we actually drew the, the support vector hyperplane? Again, we'll just kind of make it a little lighter. Uh, we go here and then probably here, right? And again, if we circled the support vectors this time, we have two here, 
and to here and this was dangerously close to being a support vector but just understand this is a toy problem I've just kind of drawn it and I, not everything I've drawn is perfect but anyways uh, so in this case right you've got two support vectors on either sides four total support vectors and we also have just plenty of data data points here that are not support vectors right so much fewer of our data is or are support vectors and that's that is in theory better because you have less overfitment going on so why is overfit you know an overfitment is just a statistical thing like you, <laughs> that's just inherently bad but what is going to end up happening like if you overfit to historical data it's just likely that in the future data you're just not going to be just right because the future is going to have noise it's going to it's going to be different than the past data so if you fit that past data perfectly you're going to screw up in the future data so you'll know this though if you do training and testing which is something we've already covered up to this point but the real question becomes let's say you train uh, and then you test and you have 52 percent accuracy and you're like wow geez that's that's no good and then you're kind of wondering hmm is are my is my theory wrong is this just something that's not going to work or maybe should i use a different kernel or, or something like that and, and you might not really know one thing you could do is take a shotgun approach and just use a different kernel see what happens right but the other thing you can do is just query to see how many support vectors do you have so maybe number of support vectors and then divide that by number of samples and if that's a, a large number <laughs> right uh, you know the closer to one that is the worse off you are and, and probably if you're in reality on a real data set if you're more than you know 10% you know, let's say you've got more than a hundred data data points uh, or feature sets rather samples whatever you want to call it if you got more than a hundred probably 10% maybe maybe you can go up to 20% but really probably 10% anything more than that you that should signal to you you've done some sort of overfitment so it might not be the case that your data is not linearly separable it might be the case but you don't know yet but maybe you should try um, try a different a different kernel like let's say you you come back with 52% accuracy 52% uh, accuracy and uh, you have I don't know um, 80 percent are support vectors okay if that's the case you got some overfitment going on maybe try a different kernel but if you've got 52 percent accuracy and only eight percent of your data is or are support vectors your data is probably not going to work out you can still try a different you know you go ahead try a different kernel but but probably uh, something else is right so what we've got here, minus all of this mess, nice and clean now, what we've got here is when you have some sort of, let's say, a, a separating hyperplane where you actually have some data that is kind of in violation of that separating hyperplane, what you have is most likely a soft margin classifier. Now, in this case, most likely we wouldn't accept a, a soft margin all the way up to this point. Uh, but keep in mind this is just for a simple example for now so uh, so what's going to happen with a soft margin a soft margin support vector machine what you're going to have as opposed to just by the obviously it should be in, in, intuitive here but the other one would just be a hard margin like this green line this is a this is a hard margin classifier right that would be a hard margin and just like the RBF is kind of like the default kernel, it's actually the case that a soft margin classifier is going to be your default. Because again, in the real world, a lot of your data is not going to be perfectly linearly separable without some degree of overfitment. So anyways, uh, so with, with, uh, with the soft margin, what you're going to have is you're going to have some sort of degree of error, right? So, so kind of like with with regression, you know, you, the distance, right, uh, from the the hyperplane, let's say, to the data point, that's going to be your error, right? And and how might we we allow some degree of error? Well, we have what we call slack. Okay, and what slack is going to be for us is generally we're going to denote slack. This little symbol here and what we're gonna do is we're gonna say okay 
remember before that constraint basically where we were we were saying that uh, y sub i x sub i dotted with w plus b and then it was either minus one is greater than or equal to zero but in this case let's say greater than or equal to one okay and in this case uh, this was the original kind of equation, but now what we can do is introduce this slack variable and say, okay, y sub i multiplied by x sub i dotted with w plus b really just needs to be greater than or equal to 1 minus our new slack variable, right? So, so we're giving it some sort of leeway here. Now, of course, uh, it would... <laughs> Slack obviously needs to be, uh, let me just write it, uh, we'll just write it up here, right? Slack must be greater than or equal to, I was almost going to write it in Python terms, but anyways, it has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? It has to be a positive number. And if it was equal to zero, then that would just be hard margin. But the more slack you give it, the more soft your margin is going to wind up being. So now you might have uh, total slack. So if we were going to say, hey, what is the, the total slack? Well, that would just be the sum of i over that slack variable of i, right? It's just the, the, the sum of all the slacks. <laughs> okay, so yay mathematic notation. So obviously, we probably, you know, you might want to, you might choose like, hey, yeah, we want to allow for some slack, but is it not kind of philosophically and logically correct that we probably want as little slack as possible, right? We, we would want to minimize <laughs> the slack. And obviously that's, you know, that's a scary, a scary term to be thrown around here. But yes, we, we, we really probably want to actually minimize the slack. So... <laughs> So how, how do we throw that into our, our actual equation? Remember in the, in the old days when we actually did the formal calculation of the support vector machine, we wanted to uh, minimize, not mimi, <laughs> minimize, and we wanted to minimize what? We wanted to minimize the magnitude of vector w. And then we said just for ease, of quadratic programming, we also, since you want to minimize the magnitude of vector w, you also want to minimize the one half of the magnitude of vector w squared, right? That's just, you know, that just works. So then what you're going to do is you're going to say plus, and then you're going to do this, this new thing that we just have right here, the sum of i over the total of slack or basically the total sum of all the slacks. So now you're going to have the sum of slacks, i, and i. And then you're gonna have this new value, and this new value is c. So now, before it was just to minimize this, but now it's actually, we wanna minimize all, we wanna minimize all of this, okay? So we've already explained what slack is. We already know what the i's are. We already know the sum of all the slacks and stuff. So what is c? I mean, just kind of looking at this equation, we want to minimize one half. Basically, we know we want to minimize the magnitude of vector w. Okay, we already kind of know what that's going to do. And then we want to, but really we want to minimize now, we're trying to minimize this whole equation. So no longer are we just trying to minimize the magnitude of vector w, we're trying to minimize the magnitude of vector w plus c times all of our slacks, right? Add it up. Okay. So sometimes, a lot of times, people are very confused of what c actually does. But if you look at this this optimization problem, it should be pretty obvious. Like what if we what if we raise what if we raise the value of c here? Well, if we raise the value of c, we're saying we want less violations because there's really no way like if we're going to try to m minimize this equation, the more we raise c, the more we're going to punish for violations of the margin. And if we lower C, we're going to be more allowing of violation because you can just you can just see like right if you if you raise the value of C, that's multiplying this right here. 
So that's just making the equation much larger. And so another way to kind of look at the value of C is to, because obviously as you, as, you, as you change C, like C and slack and all of those things have absolutely no relation to the magnitude of vector W. So except in this, this little minimization requirement optimization problem. So, so because of that, C is actually kind of like, um, it's where you get to decide how important slack is in relation to minimizing the magnitude of vector W, right? So it's kind of your way of, of kind of teeter tottering between, you know, whatever personal values you might have in, in the specific example that you're running. So C is something that you're going to kind of set as a hard, you're going to say, okay, I want C to be equal to one or five or 0.5 or 0.2 or whatever. And obviously the smaller you make C, the less it, you know, the less it, it matters what the slacks are, right? The, the less it matters what those errors, that violation, the less it matters, right? Because the smaller you multiply this, these, you know, the, the sum of all of the slacks, the smaller that is, you're, you're minimizing the equation, right? Just by changing C a little bit. Uh, so that is what C is, that's what slack is, and that's kind of what, uh, that's what the soft margin classifier is doing. And again, the kind of purpose of a soft margin classifier is so you don't overfit your data. And in most cases, that's what you're actually gonna be running is a soft margin classifier because uh, most real examples are just simply not linearly separable. And if you take it to the number of dimensions required to make it linearly separable, you've probably done some overfitment. So, you know, one way you can kind of test this and compare it is, is do a soft margin classifier, let's say, and set C equal to like a million, right? And then see how accurate you are and then compare it on that same data set where C equals one, right? I'm pretty sure in, in um, in scikit-learn, the default for C is one, but we'll we'll look at that shortly. Um, but anyways, that is the soft margin classifier. Now, up until this point, we have not really we we have not done any Python for kernels. We haven't done any Python to show what I was talking about. Even just like what if you didn't want to use a kernel and just translate into another dimension? Could you? How does that actually work? To so visually seeing how translating to another dimension it can help you. You know, just to conceptualize how all of this works. Uh, so uh, in the next tutorial, what we're going to do is we're going to finally pull out Python, and we'll show a quick example of translating to another space. Then we're going to pull out uh, both kernels and CVX opt uh, for the quadratic programming. And then after that, we're going to kind of bebop back on over to the scikit-learn version of the support vector machine. We're going to run through some of the parameters there and kind of point out a lot of the things that we've covered so far along the way. And most likely, most likely, that will be the, the final support vector machine tutorial. And we'll be moving on in to clustering. Uh, and then after that, deep learning. So anyways, if you have questions, comments, concerns, whatever up to this point, feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for all the support and subscriptions. And until next time.